Så the so the, the end point of the last lecture was that Rafi sketched how super how the to define super string theory in a way that is parallel to bosonic string. So if you remember the starting point, the, the point where we got to was the idea that uh, one could imagine again sort of a super worksheet. <coughs> Mapped into space time. And after gauge fixing, uh, one ends up with a sort of a super conformal theory. It's a theory that behaves reasonably under under the sort of uh, transformations And uh, so one, one main, my main property of, the, of this super field theory is that it has a stress tensor traceless stress tensor and it has a super current which uh, in, a, in this conformal gauge is denoted as usually as g and g bar so Roughly speaking, like T, T is something like a, uh, so the T, T remember transforms up to central charge, like something with a true G indices, so like a square of the Jacobian, plus some correction proportional to the central charge. And this guy has a power of, of three halves of the Jacobian. So this is, if you want, in terms of the again values of delta and delta bar, behavior under scaling and rotation. These guys have a uh, quantum number to zero and zero two. And these guys have quantum number three halves, zero and zero three halves. Now, uh, the same way as we didn't really study conformity theories in, the, in our lectures, we will not study super conformity theories particularly. Uh, Rather, I'm going to just look at the simplest example, the one that is relevant for studying superstrings moving in flat space, uh, which is the theory where, which is the supersymmetric generalization of the free scalar. So it's a theory which includes a free scalar and a free fermion. So intuitively, the reason that I've, I'm trying to be the sort of a super scalar, a scalar which is a function of super space, and when you expand it, you get a free scalar, then you get That then in principle there is also something like this. 
So uh, if you look at the transformations under the thermofeasance, you see that essentially when you do it, when you do as a coordinate transformation, a standard coordinate transformation for Z, theta gets multiplied by the square root of the Jacobian. Probably a power. Uh, there must have been a minus sign over there. But it doesn't matter. So because X was transforming a scalar field had no powers of the Jacobian, the result is that this guy uh, gets the power of the Jacobian. So psi transforms like that. kind of like the screw root of how the curtain transforms. Yes. Then there is a final guy uh, which actually drops out. So the equations of motion for x Classically, are del del bar x equal to zero. Equation of motion for psi are del bar psi equal to zero, and del psi bar equal to zero. And the equation of motion for f is f equal to zero. So we're going to forget about f promptly. Mm -hmm. So I just had a question going back to kind of the start. Why do we need super strings as opposed to? The bosonic string. Bosonic string is a tachyon, so it's garbage in the physical theory. Uh, so the super strings, I don't know, at this moment it's just an attempt to find another particular string that might be more interesting. Uh, which, more precisely, we want, we want a theory of strings which has fermions. If, if nothing else, right, in nature we see fermions. Bosonic string only has bosons. Uh, so a theory of strings that would be interesting for describing the universe should have fermions too. So that I mimic the construction of this string theory on the one-dimensional theory which describes one fermion. And we'll see what kind of expectation we get in the string theory. I guess so, I mean, we'll, we'll still have the bosonic mode, so sort of schematically how do the tachyons cancel out? Like how do we not have the tachyon modes? Uh, we'll see. So, so psi and psi bar together are the two modes of a free fermion. They're like a, the two chiral halves of a free fermion. Now, usually when you work with fermions, I used to see gamma matrices all over the place. Uh, in, in, the conf in, in conformal gauge, uh, there is a way to just fix your gamma matrix with some very convenient values and just forget about them so that the Dirac equation, for example, becomes something very simple. And the action becomes also something very simple. So, well, normally a fermion is a right, something which transforms as a in a special, specific way under uh, Lorentz transformations which involve gamma matrices. Uh, when you look at conformal transformations on the plane only, all that defines a fermion is just this square root of the Jacobian put in front of it. So a free fermion is just some guy of dimension one half comma zero. And as you see from the Lagrangian, quantizing the free Fermi is not going to be any harder than quantizing the ghost. Uh, it's a first order action. So it's rather simple to work with. Uh, pretty much. So we remember we expanded the, the free boson in mode. And then we quantize it by something like that.
for the fifth fermion, again, we're going to expand it in mode. And I've done some computation relation. The stress tensor is roughly something like this. And then there is this super current, which looks like that. So these are pretty much all the only bilinears you can write. So roughly speaking, the supersymmetry transformations map x into psi and psi into dx. Okay. So they typically map g into t. <coughs> so if you act, so either you send x to psi and you get this term, or you act from psi transforming to dx and you get this term. Forget about the factors of one half that I'm having floating around anyway. Uh, I guess I explained that one half to one. So, okay, so the basic ingredients are relatively easy. And uh, using this one, we can do, we can just understand roughly the, the super strain spectrum. He said this is the result of course ghost. Uh, sorry, perhaps I, the N was not the, <coughs> the best possible choice of a symbol. I was supposed to subscribe. So, uh, so there is some B and C. With some beta and gamma. Uh, I, I essentially will say nothing about them. Uh, just know that roughly that they exist. And then there's a BRC charge. Uh, which very roughly looks like that. Now, when you quantize the fermions on the cylinder, there is a very basic choice to make, you need to make. You need to decide if these fermions are going to be periodic or anti-periodic. Now, you might ask why. Why should I worry about this after all? For the boson, I just took it periodic and I was happy. Uh, the reason is that because of the screw, the screw of the Jacobian, when you change coordinate systems, you actually might end up switching the periodicity of your fermions. In particular, imagine I'm trying to match the cylinders to the plane with the usual exponential mass. That means that the fermion on the plane, sorry, the fermion on the cylinder is related to the fermion on the plane by right, something like that. You see, this is going to go to minus itself as you rotate the state, the, the imaginary part of S, which means that something that is periodic on the plane will become anti-periodic on the cylinder and vice versa. In particular, for example, if you're looking at the state operator map, things like which are standard operators like the identity, say, I, 
all mapped to states on the cylinder. So these are operators with the property that if you bring a fermion around them, it goes back to itself. But because of that, it means that if you bring the fermion around the corresponding state, it goes to minus itself. So these ones become anti-periodic states, which uh, Sorry, not periodic fermion. Whereas this section of the Hilbert space is called the NS section. Conversely, if you want to study states which are which lead, which seem to be more, more normal, which seems to leave your fermion periodic, become partial. So these are really guys that send psi of sigma equal to 2 pi equal to minus psi of sigma equal to 0. If you want to look into the states that are periodic, the property that psi of sigma equal to pi equal to psi of 0 is called the Ramon set. This must map to operators which make the fermion antiperiodic. So this must be operators with the property that psi z psi, psi equal to 2 pi i z equal to minus psi of z in the presence of the operator. So if you rotate the psi around the operator, it must go back to minus itself. Kind of operators are called quick fields. <coughs> and they might be, they might take a little bit to, to get used to them. Um, so they are, they are operators which are defined in a theory, not by putting some of your elementary fields in the path integral, but rather by modifying the path integral. The twist field is an operator that is inserted in a, in, a, in a calculation by saying, I do the path integral over fermions which are anti periodic around this operator. Now, have you guys seen the Ising model? That's good. Uh, what do you remember of the Ising model? So, I mean, have you seen the solution of the Ising model? So, right, in the Ising model, you have this system of, uh, of fermions. I don't know if the camera can actually see you. I assume yes. Right. And perhaps at some point, they told you that the Ising model is equivalent to the of the fermion. Or not. I'm not sure. Possibly not. Um, so in the in the so in this model, you have sort of elementary variables, right? Which can be plus minus one. And uh, right, if you remember, there is a sort of some a sort of phase diagram, right? The function of the temperature, uh, your if you're at high temperature, your, your steam are disordered. If you have a low temperature, they are ordered. In the middle, there's the second order phase transition, which actually so it gives a theory which has scale invariance. It's actually conformal to theory. And it's essentially theory has the same properties of theory of, of, of free fermions. Uh, now, recognizing the, fer the free fermions in this picture is usually not easy. Uh, the reason is that in terms of the theory of free fermions, the operator sigma, which 
is the is the wave of this, which, which measures this. The average locally, the average of these spins is a twist field for the Fermi. For several states, we want to define the Fermi operator inside this. In this model, you actually need to model sort of. Uh, change the midpoint. So you can consider pictures like that where you, you have your Hamiltonian. So sum of sigma i, sigma i, uh, sigma j for i j neighbor. And you can imagine adding some some line going through your lattice. And switching the sign of the interaction for all the edges which are intersecting the line. So if here there is an interaction of between edges, we call it IJ, JIJ. Usually your J is one everywhere. But you can put j equal to minus 1 at some of the, some of the links. Now, the position of this line really actually doesn't really matter. Meaning, if I, if I want to move this line from here to here, for example, so that these links become normal and this link become reverse. Perhaps you can see that you just need to flip the sign of this thing. So if you send sigma i to minus sigma i, all the, the sign of the interaction of all the edges which go into this point switches. So this sort of line, adding this line does really nothing to your midpoint. You can move this line around. But if this line ends somewhere, then there is something interesting going on there. So this is a way to create a local operator in your as in model, which is not made out of the elementary field. And out of this kind of local operators, you can actually build the free, those free Fermi uh, that solve the model. Conversely, from the point of view of the free fermion, you can start with the theory of free fermion and define an operator by doing a path integral. Or all configuration of essentially, like, roughly speaking, you, you're sort of adding a, a line with a property that psi goes to minus itself every time you cross it. Because as location of this line doesn't matter, but if the line ends, that matters. So the properties of the theory here are different. There is really a local operator instead of here. You can ask what are the properties of this local operator. And the way you do it is exactly by going back to the cylinder and seeing what happens. This tells you the so if, if you go out things like the again values of L0, L0, how the first tensor acts on it, and that tells you how, what are the properties of this operator. Now doing calculations in the presence of twist, of twist fields uh, can be interesting. So if only, if you just have, say, see, you have a bunch of twist fields and a bunch of fermions. Because the free fermion theory is still a free theory, still covered by a Gaussian path integral, uh, I can still sort of use weak theorem and replace the fermions with some two point functions. <coughs> I need to compute the two point function, the Green's function in the presence of this twist operator, which might take some effort. But then I still have the problem of computing the correlation function after I've got rid of all the fermions. And doing the front point of view of path integral is very challenging. Uh, you would need to essentially compute the determinant. Uh, the, it's a, a, you're computing a Gaussian integral. Right? Uh, so the answer, if you don't have any insertion of psi, is just the determinant 
of this gel bar operator, of this knitted term. But it's a knitted term in the presence of this antiferodic uh, twist field, of these antiferodic boundary conditions, which uh, makes the calculation rather challenging. Luckily, there are other ways based on conformity theory, uh, which allow you to answer this sort of questions. There are differential equations satisfied by this correlation function, which can be used to solve, to, to compute them. So just to say that even if I introduce these extra complicated looking ingredients, uh, everything remains fully calculable. Uh, although perhaps free field theory is not anymore the best way to do it, really knowing quantum uh, conformity theory becomes uh, important. So, but for computing things on the cylinder, uh, we don't need any of these. So all we need to do is to just query expand psi and apply our commutation relations. Now if I have Neville, so Neville Schwartz boundary conditions, meant uh, antiperiodic states for the fermion. I'm going to expand my fermion in Fourier mode with, which, with an index that is shifted by a, a half. Let me just write it very roughly. Exactly the correct ones, but this is okay. Uh, so, this, with the modes for this fermion carry an half integral index, then the commutation relations are still written like that, but n lives in the uh, integral shifted by half. So, I can write it as psi n with n belonging to z plus one half. Or I can just write it as psi n plus one half. Uh, well, let's not think like that. So the, the Fourier modes I have are things like psi one half, psi minus one half, psi three halves, psi minus three halves, et cetera. And then to commute. And each of these raises the energy by the corresponding amount. So psi minus one half will raise the energy by one half. And there are also, of course, psi bars. It's still the same. On the other hand, on the Ramon sector, I'm going to expand my fermion in, in standard integral mode. So I have modes which are integer valid. And then everything's more or less like this, but I have psi one and psi, psi minus one, which have to commute, etc. But crucially, I also have a psi zero. Now, uh, to understand the effect of this psi zero is actually useful to keep track of all the fermions we have in the game. So let me put back the Lorentz indices, which I suppressed.
Now, this should remind you something you saw yesterday. Essentially, tell you that if psi naughts are gamma matrices. When the Ramon sector has two sets of gamma matrices acting on my state, so it means that the basic states of my in the Ramon sector will have to sit in some spinor representation of the Lorentz group. So perhaps for now I can denote them like that, where A is a spinor index acted upon by knots, and A bar acted upon the sign of bar. Can you give a factor of two? Whatever. So this is really important. Um, so these are space-time spinors. Okay. So superstring theory has space-time spinors. That's permanent. So the psi nodes are playing exactly the same role as, as the. I mean, this was the main reason we added psi to the theory of a single particle to get gamma matrices. When I do it in string theory, I actually get too many too many reaches. I get two. Uh, sets of gamma matrices and two spinors. So you might say, oh, wait, this is actually not a, not a fermion. But the point is that here I, what I call an S is really something, something like an S and S bar, right? I took no, 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 an S antiperiodic member condition for the, both the size and the psi bars. This I should probably call an RR. Because I have Ramon boundary conditions for both uh, the holomorphic and anthropomorphic size. In principle, nothing prevents me from considering situations where the psi are periodic and the psi bars are antiperiodic. So I could consider something like an NSR sector where. I have psi one half, etc., but I have psi bar zero. Mm -hmm. So why are like psi one not? Oh, I guess well, I guess yeah, the question is why do we only have psi zero as the gamma matrices when we have the same anti-commutation relations for the other ones? Well, so see when I when I try to define a vacuum uh, for these guys, so the vacuum has to be Killed by say psi one, and then you build on top, you build on it by psi minus one. But the properties of the vacuum do not depend much on what what you are doing here. You define your vacuum however you want, and then these guys act uh, act upon it to create new states, and the other guys act act on it. These guys like, kill the vacuum, and they act on other states by these anti-commutation relations. Uh, on the other hand here, the, uh, the zero modes really map the vacuum among themselves. So the structure of the zero modes, the quantum numbers carried by zero modes are much more important than understanding what are the properties of the vacuum. Uh, now, See, in principle, even for the theory of free bosons, okay, you could have told me, wait, you said that my vacua are labeled by C and that's you know scalar, and then I act on, on them with my oscillators to make things with indices. But why didn't I just add some indices by hand to this guy? Why didn't I say that, it's, that I have a bunch of you know, 10 vacuums, 26 vacua rotated by my, uh, uh, by my Lorentz transformations. Now, the point is that we don't talk, so if, if, you, if you just did the quantum mechanics, okay, so Lorentz transformation was just some operator that you pick, 
define arbitrarily in the quantum mechanics, this would be perfectly okay. On the other hand, uh, in a quantum field theory, your Lorentz transformations are not something that you get at random. It's something you build as the integral of a locally conserved current. So the local current of uh, Lorentz transformations, and then the, Lorentz trans the charge comes from integrating the current over the whole phase. So the point is that your Lorentz, so your Lorentz current would be something like, I don't know, x dx, x mu dx mu. Okay. And uh, plus possibly some, some renormalization. Okay, so we find a problem in quantum, in quantum theory, might, we, we need some point splitting or something like that. So normal order this. But it's important, all counter terms, all modifications you do have to be local. You cannot do a modification which depends on where you're living. Because of that, the expression for the actual law of the generator is essentially fixed. You know, it'll be something like, I don't know, uh, I don't remember it by heart, but uh, something like that. Actually, probably one of them. Because of that, the action of the Lorentz generators in the vacuum is not something that is free to, you're free to decide. This Lorentz generator acting on the vacuum gives you zero. So the vacuum is a scalar. Or gives you, actually, more precisely, it's going to give you something like uh, T mu, that T mu, of course. Well, T mu is mu. But anyway, so it only acts on this T label. So, so the correct answer to your question here is that I can write the Lorentz, the current for the Lorentz transformations I can normal order them, regularize them I get something like some psi n mu psi minus n mu something like that and then I act them on the vacuum and these guys don't contribute at all when I'm acting on the vacuum. But these ones do. And this reduces exactly to the expression of the Lorentz generator built out of gamma matrix. This is the full answer of why you get uh, a very specific representation for your ground state in terms of the zero mode. So in the so here, we get just the ground state for the fermion. No fancy Lorentz indices. But then we get something with true Lorentz indices. Here, we get something with a single Lorentz index, spinner index, and the same here. And then you build on them with fermions. Now, if you remember, I anticipated that this theory of superstrings is in 10 dimensions. So these are 10 dimensional spinners. If I get time at the end of the lecture, I'll have a very quick review of how spinner representations are built in various representations. I'm not sure I'll be able to get to that. But anyway, so these are 32 dimensional spinners, and they can split into a positive and negative chirality uh, spinners. When you act with psi, on a positive chirality, you get a ne negative chirality, and vice versa. Um, now, at this point, we can essentially start building up the spectrum of superstring theory, except for the uh, information about the Casimir energy of the ground state, which I cannot tell, I cannot compute for you because it has contributions from the super goal, from the goal. Now, notice that depending on the sector you're in, Ramon or Nevertour, 
the supercurrent will be periodic or anti-periodic. But your BRC charge better just current be better be periodic, otherwise you couldn't define the conserved charge as zero mode. So gamma ends up having the same periodicity as your fermions. So the change in periodicity for gamma and for the fermions affects the Casimir energy. So all in all, the Casimir energies, or if you want to again, the and not again again values of this guy are minus one half. Including the, the effect of the super ghost, the ghost, the bosons, and, and the fermions. While for these guys, there is no Casimir energy. And we have to understand this is actually that because in this sector the supercurrent is uh, periodic, you can define the zero mode of the supercurrent, which is a supersymmetry transformation. And this is it. You know, there is a In general, there is a there is a is almost a theorem that every time you have uh, supersymmetry, uh, something that some supercharge squares to the Hamiltonian, your ground states typically have zero. Uh, anyway, let's just let's, let's take it as a fact. So we can start computing things. So we want to find things that are skewed by Ln's and by a zero possibly modulo null states and also killed by G and so the first class of states we can consider are just momentum modes for the, for the two bosons with no oscillators, neither bosonic nor fermionic. And these guys are going to give you tachyons. It's, here, it's still here, it hasn't gone anywhere. Next. Uh, we can try to, comp to compensate this minus one half by acting with oscillators instead of uh, changing the moment, setting the momentum to be one. So I can do something like that. This gives me massless states. And as you can guess, this looks more or less the same thing as we got in bosonic strings. Some guy with two indices. Just that it's built out of the psi instead of being built out of the uh, A. And this gives you the usual graviton plus D field plus Tillerson. At some point, you could. Just say, okay, why do we do all of this just to get another tachyon? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the condition you have with the G sub n? Just G sub n? G n, sorry. So I'm fine. Just the, the positive Fourier mode of. Uh, yeah. so, so, what, so the LN condition comes from the constraints on, on the stress tensor. That's right. Where, where does this, where from does the constraints. So the constraint of the stress tensor was the equation of motion for the matrix. Okay. This, so it sets t to zero. Right. And then there's another equation of motion, g to z equal to zero, which comes from the gravitino. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Roughly speaking, these conditions are required. You, you need two sets of conditions because you have two sets of dangerous modes. Okay. There is the uh, time-like scalar, but also the time-like fermion. Mm -hmm. so, uh, do you want n well, I'm including I'm including here the fact of all the ghosts. So I, because I defined a zero zero equal to minus one half. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, sorry, I 
output of this. Well, okay, it's the same as in the boson extreme. There's a Casimir energy. So uh, S0 on P is P squared over 2 minus 1 half. Yes. That's how it looks. Now, so this is Taken that looks bad. Luckily, there is something here that we did not have uh, in the bosonic string. It's called something called the fermion number. So I can define a fermion number operator with a property that anti commutes with all the fermions. The action of the fermions can be, this could be, for example, one of the uh, Lorentz generators. It can be, that can be built out of the Lorentz generators. Uh, it's just a rotation of, uh, of pi in a lot of planes. But actually, um, because the supercharge has terms like this, so the BFT charge has terms like this, and you want this to be a useful operator in your theory, which in particular means leave the supercharge invariant. Mm -hmm. Does this mean the energy is commutational? Ah, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you need to do something like that for gamma, too. And for beta. So pretty much uh, this operator sort of recognizes that the things that are there in super strings and not in bosonic strings. And then I can define another from another operator, like uh, anteromorphic from another operator, which only anti commutes the Okay. Now, so this is a conserved quantum number, and it behaves well with the BFT charge, which means that when I have some sort of scattering process of strings, this quantum number will be preserved. Now, uh, it turns out that because of these conditions, the ground state of the ghost have a funny uh, value of this quantum number. So in particular, minus 1 to the f t is actually minus t. So this guy has quantum numbers under minus 1 to the f and minus 1 to the f bar, which are minus and minus. Now, and these guys are obtained. Uh, obtained from, by acting with another fermion on that. So this is quantum numbers plus and plus. Which means that when you scatter these guys together, you never create a target. So you can consistently drop it. This is called the GSO projection. The so projection tells you only you should only keep things that are uh, invariant under the action of this minus one to the f. <coughs> and magically, there's no more tachyon. The theory makes sense, <laughs> and uh, everything can work. So this sort of GSO projection gives you something that's called type two superstring theory. There are two variants of type two depending on how you how you define the action of minus one to the f on the Ramon spectrum. So as I mentioned, there are two chiralities. 
can decompose your index. Of whatever you get into sort of indices, you can decompose it into either positive or negative parality guys. And they're going to have minus 1 to the f equal to say 1 or minus 1 or vice versa. One of the two choices gives you type A, and the other gives you type B, two A and two B superstring theory. So depending on the choice, the GSO projection ends up throwing away slightly different combinations of this uh, Ramon Ramon set of fields. So are you saying that um, there is no way to build a space that has uh, the fermion number minus one even overlapping with more uh, psi psi work? No, no, no. I'm just saying that if you take true these string states, Right, and you scatter them. It can be built uh, different combinations. Or I, can, I can look at the rest of my spectrum as well, no? Sure, sure. So there will be a big spectrum. And none of them Everything is massive. Mm -hmm. Some have plus plus, some oh, have so minus minus. Okay. And uh, <coughs> okay. we only keep the plus plus. Now, what do we do on this side? On this side, we have our ground states. And as I said, L0, that there is no Casimir energy on the side, on the Ramon side. So we we'll only need to adjust things on the left, on the holomorphic side, anthelomorphic side. You can do something like that. with this square equal to zero. And then the GSO projection will uh, keep only one of the two paralities here. I guess uh, with the notation I have there, it's probably alpha naught. Uh, no, yes, plus whatever. So what is this state? It's a state which carries a, a spinner and a vector index. It is massless. And it actually has an interesting gauge symmetry if you look at the null state. So if you put a polarization of sorts, you have a gauge, you have a you have null states of the form uh, So it turns out that this is exact, this state is uh, precisely a space-time gravity. So it's a super, it's a partner of the graviton for supersymmetric theory, in, which is supersymmetric in, in, in space-time. This is a little bit surprising, right? Our starting point was super worship, but normal space-time. But then, the, the theory presents us with a gravitino. So there's actually a theorem that uh, much as when you have a gra whenever you're in front of the theory, a state, a spin true state, massless, which looks like a graviton, it is a graviton. It couples to everything like a graviton. You know, the, your theory must be diffeomorphism invariant. Then there's another theorem that says that whenever you sort of spin three halves state, massless, with a gauge symmetry, uh, has to be a gravitino. Your theory has to be a supersymmetric theory with super diffeomorphism invariant coupled to supergravity. So, uh, a bit magically, the superstring theory became, becomes a theory 
from the supersymmetric period in space time. Now, the precise type of supersymmetry depends on which gravitinos your theory has. So, for example, depending here on your choice type 2a or type 2b, your gravitinos will be of the same type of the same chirality or of opposite chirality. In type 2a, your gravitinos of opposite chirality. In type 2b, your gravitinos of the same chirality. And so this means that a low energy theory will be some supergravity theory in 10 dimensions. Uh, the gravitinos either of the same chirality or the opposite, opposite chirality. So these gravi supergravity theories were, were known, uh, I mean, I've known, and uh, the, you know, the, the Lagrange and the interactions are just fixed by supersymmetry. So uh, this sort of allows you to write down the low energy effective action for first plane theory just because you know it's supergravity. Or I guess in principle you could also do it as I, as I was describing in some lecture by starting with some uh, super string moving in the ground and, and doing the normalization group flow. Uh, finally, you get some states from the Ramon-Ramon sector. As you can imagine here, I don't need to add anything. This is already a massless state, uh, which carries two spinor indices. You can always convert two spinor indices into space standard Lorentz indices by using our matrices. So these states are going to give you a whole bunch of bosonic fields in spacetime. Uh, they're called Ramon Ramon uh, fields. They're just a bunch of forms. They're generalizations of gauge fields of various, with various number of indices which couple to D-brains. So D-brains in this supersymmetric theory, in the superstring theories, are sources for these Ramon, uh, Ramon fields. And precisely because they are sources for these Ramon fields, while normal strings are not sources of Ramon fields, that tells you that these D-brains will have to be stable because the, the carry charges we cannot go anywhere anywhere else, they cannot decrease to strings. So D-brains become a very, so D-brains also have notation if they have the correct dimensionality. I'm not gonna go into details. But uh, so they, they exist and make sense in the superstring theory and they're very, very important ingredients. Indeed you're, perhaps uh, you can turn things around if you, if you just, if somebody had told you that, you know, this sort of superstring theory exists that is a generalization of supergravity where you have some big dynamical objects coupled to the fields of supergravity. Um, I mean, in principle, all these dynamical objects are on the same footing. Uh, it just happens that one of those objects becomes light when you turn off the, 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 the cutting of the strings of your, of your theory. And the, all the other objects become very heavy. And so, there is some limit in which your theory can be described in per perturbation theory by fluctuations of these, or the dynamics of these light objects, which are the strings. But uh, typically in the supergravity theories, there are many, many corners in your space of coupling in which different objects might become light. And uh, so in principle, one can set up different perturbation theories based on different objects. Sometimes these objects are against strings. And so th this gives right to uh, very important uh, dualities that relate different string theories. Such that, you know, in some values, for some regions of the parameter space, your theory can be described as some string theory. Some other region parameter space can be described like a different string theory in terms of different ingredients. When one is weakly coupled, the other is strongly coupled, and vice versa. Um, first, last thing I, I should perhaps mention 
there is a very close relation between the fact that we kill the tachyon in this geostorm projection and the fact we have, that we have a gravitino. See, uh, when you have, here we did everything on the cylinder. We felt free to have Ramon, NS, periodic, antiperiodic, whatever. But once you start putting, transforming these states into operators and putting these operators on your worksheet, I don't know, here I'm, I want to put my Ramon state, here I want to put my graviton side side bar. Okay. Uh, well, I might start worrying. You know, this Ramon field makes some of the uh, things antiperiodic and some periodic. For example, around this operator, psi is going to be period antiperiodic, and psi bar is going to be periodic. So my coercion function does not look single valued anymore, uh, which surely is going to create troubles in calculation. So although I can make a big list of states, not all of these states in the list can actually simultaneously exist in the same theory. They must correspond to operators which are local with respect to each other. It can be, they, they, they get no phases when transported around each other. It just so happens that this GSO projection exactly ensures that that's the case. So, for example, if I want to keep the token, if I decided not to throw away the token, then I could not keep this guy. Because I thought that this guy is antiperiodic around the token. But if I want my gravitino, then I have to throw away the token. This is another way to understand why the GSO projection. You can, in principle, define theories in which you throw away the gravitino and you keep the token. They're called type zero theories. They are as sick as both of the extremes. Uh, in principle, they can be defined. Finally, there is one more thing that you can do to define interesting superstrings. So here I added I had my z and z bar, I added theta and theta bar. So I had psi and psi bar. In principle, you can do something intermediate between bosonic string and this full superstring, which only add size and not psi bar. Uh, this is still enough to give you fermions, it's still enough to give you a gravitino, but only one instead of two, and, defines, and to define some interesting theories which are called heterotic strings, heterotic string theories. Uh, with regards to the coupling, you were saying you could put the coupling in the duality. Yes. Uh, do we have, uh, I mean, ultimately the goal of the program was to, you know, in, in low energy limit actually produce uh, my regular PLT, but not give me anything I can say about what my coupling should actually be. Like, just give me, pick my numbers. Well, which QFT do you want? Well, I, w I guess I would want standard model, right? Yes. So if you understand the model, clearly, in theory, in 10 dimensions, is not going to do well for so you. So there's a, okay. What you can do is to take some of these chunks, some of this stuff, and replace it with something else. As long as you have one invariant, you're fine. But right? while invariants, you're fine. So you can take four x's, size, by bars, and something else. The least of the possible something else is enormous because there are a lot of conformal field theories. And on top of that, it's likely that our world is not described by perturbative string theory. In a sense, we don't see, the, we don't see any, any dilaton, uh, as far as we know. So on top of that, you need to take those theories and move away from, from weak coupling. There might be further no perturbative effects, which one has to take into account. Uh, so the short answer is we don't know how to uh, get precisely our work. If you play the very basic games, you can get kind of interesting Words typically with a lot of supersymmetry because uh, the way things are more tractable. Uh, for example, there's something called KBL compactification, which gives you uh, a four dimensional supergravity theory with uh, uh, eight supersymmetries, eight supercharges, which is way too much to, to, to make contact with our universe. But uh, well, you can put a theoretic string on the KBL, then things get better. So a theoretic string typically. Uh, at least in the beginning, was seen much more promising because it has uh, non-abelian gauge fields built in, 
without even putting any deep brains. But then people discover deep brains and they realize they could put, they can find on a billion gauge field in, uh, uh, in type two as well. And then there are dualities which relate all sorts of theories among themselves. So what can I say? There, there seem to be a possibly large space of uh, vacua superstring theory. So all of these different modifications of superstring super theory are presumably connected among themselves. So it's still one theory, but it has many, many different manifestations. And we do not understand the dynamics of the theory well enough to know if some of these are preferred to others. I think for a while the dream was that by some, mag you know, some magic, we would just end up with one possibility and would end up being the, the standard model. Uh, for example, when people started studying ways to replace scalars with something else, uh, with Calabi-Aus, in the beginning it thought, well, maybe there is only a few calabi and then they found a lot. Uh, the alternative is that maybe all of these possibilities are valid. So the string theory can describe almost everything. Uh, I would say that at the moment, the original dream, which was to bootstrap yourself all the way from, from our energies all the way to the Planck scale by saying there is a unique way to complete quantum gravity into something, is probably lost. So one of the lessons of string theory has been very harsh. Uh, it's easy. There is plenty of ways to get a, quant a theory of quantum gravity. There, they are they come a dime at a dozen for the dozen. Uh, what can I say? <laughs> it's sad, but it might, it might mean that actually we cannot boost up. Perhaps uh, the most pessimistic possibility is that the only way to know what's going on at the Planck scale is actually to scatter something at the Planck scale. I mean, philosophically, it's a valid possibility. I don't really know what to what to what to ask with. Uh, we can surely keep searching. I mean, the biggest possible discovery I can, I can imagine in this context is to find some other theory, which is not string theory, and it has it has the same resilience. Some other theory which is rob robust cannot be makes sense at every energy, and cannot be deformed into back to string theory. But we have not been very lucky about, very lucky with that. Uh, so for example, ADSFT offers in principle a way to construct theories of quantum gravity by starting from some quantum field theory in one less dimension. Now, the, the, the first example of holography of ADSFT came from string theory. There's a theory called Linical Force of Mills. It's a four-dimensional gauge theory, the maximally supersymmetric generalization of uh, Young Mills theory. <laughs> and by, because of string theory, we knew that the holographic dual was a, one of the supergravity theories, was a superstring theory. Right. Then you can look for other quantum field theories and say, maybe I'll be lucky. Maybe the holographic dual of this other quantum field theory will be some other theory of quantum gravity, which is not string theory. And at some point, people discovered other theories which had really nothing to do with this n equals four super mills, and which have an holographic dual. But again, it turned out to be a string theory, or an M theory, which is a variant of string theory. Uh, it, it, very, it might be that, I mean, I, I might take, one might take this as an indication that if you try to do things with supersymmetry, you're probably always going to end up with, with string theory. It's not a proof, of course. One can you know, keep trying to list quantum field theories. Uh, and I would like to stress, although the way that it's really presented, holography is tied up to string theory in the sense they would, they would say, okay, I take a gauge theory of matrices, I do a large N, I get this sort of proof of expansion I discussed yesterday, I interpret the Farman diagrams as surfaces, then this becomes a string theory. Uh, in this other example I mentioned, this uh, called ADGM theory, for some values of the parameters, this is not true. So there is no reason for which an individual graphic dual is M theory, it's not a string, not string theory, it's a theory of stuff which is not strings, but still connected to string theory. So I don't, I don't, I don't know 
would, would be a good strategy to find such a theory, alternative to string theory. They might exist. It would be very nice to find them. Uh, but even so, that would, it would likely just lengthen even more the list of possible ways to get a UV completion of something that looks like our universe. So at the moment, string theory does not give us UV completion of our precisely our universe. It might or not be. We're not strong enough to, to verify that's the case. But it surely gives to the UV completion of a lot of universes which don't look that different from ours. Maybe they're a bit more supersymmetric. Fine. But you know, they have graviton, gauge fields, matter fields, fermions. Uh, what can I say? Any questions? If not, let's thank David for the question.